What Remains of Edith Finch is unlike any game I've ever played. Its unusual stories and storytelling mechanics awe players and inspire widely different but equally deep feelings and insights. No matter what you think of the game, you are motivated to think deeply and carefully about its themes that are presented to us in beautiful and disturbing detail. As a brief summary, if it's been a while since you played the game or if you're just curious, this game is a story about a girl named Edith Finch, the last of her family left alive, revisiting her family's abandoned home after her mother passes away. As she explores the different rooms, each immortalized as shrines by the eccentric matriarch of the family, Edie, she learns more about how her family members died and how they lived. As Edith rewrite a history of the Finches and the stories they told each other about a curse that followed the family, killing all but one member of each generation. In short, it's a game about death and family. But there's something about what remains of Edith Finch that escapes definition. It's a hard game to analyze. Or maybe what can make it so difficult to interpret is the player's relationship with death, which I have an admittedly uneasy and complex relationship with right now. But before getting into that, I wanted to say that just as this game is unlike a traditional game, this video will also be unlike my previous videos. As a screen therapy review, I'll still outline the ways that we can use our experience with what remains of Edith Finch to strengthen our emotional intelligence and psychological well-being, but to get there, we'll need to do some digging. Eudaimonia First, I'd like to revisit the basics. Every piece of media, every story ever written falls somewhere on the spectrum between providing fun, cheery, and light hedonic pleasure and the serious, dramatic, and inspirational eudaimonic pleasure. Just as a note, this doesn't rate media in terms of its usefulness for psychological well-being or for how important it is, even though we're often told comedies or fun media are less important. Studies actually show that we need a balanced diet of both media types for optimal mood management. But understanding where a game or movie falls on this spectrum will help us understand what we gain psychologically from interacting with it. This game is unrelenting eudaimonia which is why people call this game a piece of art. It inspires us to stretch psychological and emotional muscles that don't get used too often in real life. We get practice with ethical and emotional riddles that are very interesting because we recognize them as a chance to learn something useful for our personal lives. Even though the stories within the game are sad or disturbing, we still love eudaimonic media like Edith Finch because they challenge us and energize us. It's difficult for anyone to think about death, loss, and grief, and we feel motivated to practice tinkering with these scary ideas in a safe space. In What Remains of Edith Finch, we see a family full of individuals struggling to make sense of death in the same way we struggle, but in an engaging, heightened reality. We can learn from the Finch's stories more about how we currently and could cope with mortality. In real life, many societies don't encourage positive death talk in polite conversation, or even among family members. Typically, we're taught from a young age that death is a topic to be avoided because it makes people nervous. We grow up and if we don't have a death positive influence in our lives, we can start avoiding the knowledge of our mortality for too long. We forget how to handle the idea of death or never develop the skill of coping with mortality at all, leading to some painful death anxiety. After all, thinking about death and accepting it as an eventuality is a difficult skill, and like any skill, we need to practice it and stay in touch with our tools to deal with death-related thoughts. This game can be one of those death-positive tools. So now that I've laid out the foundation of the psychological arena this game puts us in, I want to set up a formal understanding of ways people cope with their mortality. This will be crucial when we look at the individual characters, their stories, and their endings later on. And by combining the psychological knowledge with the stories and what remains of Edith Finch, we can learn more about healthier ways we can relate to death in our daily lives. How we cope with death. The history of the Finches and their curse suggested to me that this game was a useful tool for thinking about how we relate to death throughout our whole lives, not just in the moment of loss. We're not aware of it, but we think about death a lot. In fact, most of our daily decisions and anxieties are influenced by subconscious death-related thoughts. The Finches are no different. In fact, they seem to have dealt with even more conscious and subconscious thoughts about mortality over the decades. Our mind has two basic ways of defending itself from the abstract threat of death. Usually what comes first are proximal defenses. Proximal here means up close and personal, 
When we have to consciously confront the idea of death as a challenge, we have a few ways to feel safer. One way is that we quickly convince ourselves that death is a distant, far-off problem we don't need to think about or worry about right now. For a short time, we consider life-prolonging habits like eating better, exercising more, and quitting smoking as a way of solving death. We may even reject the idea of dying so much that we soothe ourselves with a feeling of invulnerability. We reassure ourselves that we are somehow immune to chance or arbitrary tragedy. These defenses, in whatever combination you use them, offer us mixed results. After all, our brains, even though they're problem-solving machines, never really solve the problem of death. We can't think death away. But typically, after engaging in one of these proximal tactics, our death-related thoughts leave our conscious awareness and we can relax a little. However, studies show that we will still be thinking about mortality on a subconscious level. This is where we initiate distal defenses. These are loftier ways of coping with death. We seek to defend our cultural worldviews, boost our self-esteem, and or strengthen relationships. Defending our cultural worldview means we want to make sure we have a strong sense of inclusion and adherence to our different cultural identities, and we want to have contributed to those cultures that will outlast us. By defending our cultural worldviews, we strengthen the idea of a meaningful reality that allows us to transcend our own mortality. Second, we want to boost our self-esteem. We want the reassurance that we're exceeding the standards and values inherent in our society or cultural groups. Feeling more self-esteem helps us feel we have left a meaningful and valued impact on the world, which will outlive us but carry our symbolic immortality into the future. And thirdly, when we feel threatened by the idea of death, we want to engage in our personal relationships more. Our families and loved ones help us feel a connection to what came before we were alive and what will come after us, giving us another sense of social immortality. Although there are about a dozen mentioned deaths in the game, I'll focus on characters that had significant relationships with death throughout their lives. If we start chronologically, the characters I want to focus on are Edith Finch Sr., Sam Finch, Walter Finch, Don Finch, and finally the playable character Edith Finch Jr. Although there are many more characters and their stories are very interesting, maybe more interesting than the characters I've chosen here, these five are the characters that evaded the so-called curse that killed the rest of the family members in their generation. They were the last survivors. These finches grew into adulthood and developed layered and complex relationships with mortality. These characters are the most relevant for us to learn from as almost all of us have or will suffer loss in our lives. We can use these characters to learn more about ourselves, how we coped, how we can cope in the future. With the exception of Edith, they are cautionary tales of what happens when we overinvest in certain proximal or symbolic distal defenses. Edie If we were to look at the family as a whole, Edie is probably the most significant member of the family and the most problematic. Not only because of her shrine-making habit that contorted the family home into a towering mausoleum, though I'm sure it didn't help the situation very much, but because of another, more heartbreaking crime that I felt Edie committed against her family. Her inability to teach her family how to grieve in a healthy way. Some people have interpreted Edie's actions and shrines as her inability to move on after loss, as if she was locked into shock or denial. But given Edie's matter-of-fact relationship with death, I never really saw this in her. I felt that she was always energized to make shrines, even for the smallest of pets, and even enjoyed it as more of a family tradition than as an act of shock or denial. In fact, maybe because of her belief in the curse, out of all the characters, Edie seemed the most comfortable and accepting of death. She openly brought it into her home and her daily life. To me, there was actually something much less healthy she did, or rather that she didn't do, that hurt everyone. Although she ritualized every loss with meticulous detail and even prepared and planned the family cemetery before the construction of the house, she didn't or couldn't prepare her family for the losses emotionally. After so many deaths, she had developed exact rituals for how to make a shrine, but she had no mentioned plan or similar ritual for how to help her children or grandchildren cope with death and mortality in the long term. She would tell them stories about the family curse and unrealistic tales about the deaths before them, but those left behind to grieve seemed to have been left on their own to figure out the arbitrary reality of death and the confusing, painful, anxiety-ridden work of surviving loved ones. Throughout the game, we never hear any talk from Edie or family members about how to cope with death. 
Not a whisper about mental health, emotional health, or family solidarity after loss. It's not just Edie. Other parents in this family didn't prepare their children for grief or didn't know how to because they were raised by an emotionally tight-lipped Edie. The only direct advice we see Edie impart is to Dawn at the end when she reminds her that by leaving the family home, they weren't going to outrun death. But insisting others confront death doesn't help them know how to. Edie, as the matriarch and creator of traditions, failed to create a healthy environment for her family to talk about death in a positive or healing way and didn't give the guidance they needed. Instead, she shrouded the lives of all her loved ones in their own losses without an outlet for the pain, confusion, and terror that each child, grandchild, and great-grandchild felt. A death-positive household could decorate similarly to Edie's home, not shying away from loss and mortality, recognizing these themes as everyday topics in our lives that shouldn't be ignored. In fact, small reminders of death can be useful to have around any home to encourage death positivity though perhaps not a dozen rooms dedicated to lost loved ones. Edie built up her home to immortalize the dead, which was unconventional and most likely unhealthy, but it was the lack of emotional infrastructure in the home that hurt the Finches the most. Edie may have tried to replace frank conversations about death and dying with fantastical stories and myths about her family, focusing on the family curse, the dragon that ate her husband, the last magical diary entry of her young daughter Molly, the comic book describing her second daughter Barbara's horror movie death, and the mole man, her son Walter, hiding from the curse under the house. Looking at her through the lens of real life, Edie is a rarity. Unlike most people we know, she surrounded herself with death and almost seemed to enjoy the curse on her family. What's so rare about Edie is that she spent no time on proximal defenses. Despite the fact that she didn't seem to engage in life-belonging activities and didn't seem that concerned with her health, she did grow to an old age. She didn't try to ignore death or make it a problem for another day. In fact, she confronted it head-on and took ownership of it. This probably helped her feel stronger in the face of loss. By believing in the curse wholeheartedly, she turned the problem of death into a fantastical calling, a destiny, a prophecy, and an adventure story. She took death and used it to make her family special, almost above average. Like everyone else in the world, they were going to die, but unlike anyone else, they were going to die magically and mythically. From this perspective, she invested her entire life into distal defenses. She created a culture from scratch within her family about death and spent every day reinforcing that culture through stories, decorating, and meticulous planning. She boosted her self-esteem by cooperating with media and giving juicy interviews, framing ghastly newspaper clippings about her family with pride, and maybe, some think, helping the comic book artists illustrate her daughter's death, since there are details in it that no one but a family member would know. Even if Edie hadn't helped write the book, it's featured prominently on Barbara's shrine. Edie enjoyed the attention and fantastic rumors about her family. Although Edie wasn't traditionally successful, to feed her self-esteem, she carved out local fame and intrigue for herself and her home. She made her family special by thinking it cursed. Subconsciously, she and real people who behave similarly might have done these things because she wanted the legends and rumors to grow and outlive her and her family, to give all the finches a kind of social immortality. They would all live on as scary stories people tell each other, mythical, doomed figures, but not tragic. She wasn't interested in being pitied, she was interested in being remembered. As for her relationships with others, although she seemed to enjoy having family around, she sadly didn't invest in cultivating these relationships into the long term. Although she related to her family members as children, close to both Edith and Dawn when they were young girls, her relationship with others as they got older seemed to wane. Although there are elements of Edie's coping mechanisms that could be helpful, such as an acceptance of death, an open awareness of its influence in our lives, some eccentric decorating to help us practice thinking about mortality every day, and an investment in family culture and traditions even if it means creating some new ones from scratch, we can still see that the bad outweighed the good for Edie's family. She focused primarily on her self-esteem and immortality and disregarded the mental health of her loved ones by insisting on making children sleep beside the shrines of their dead siblings and never seeming to invest in healthy, realistic communication about death or even counseling services for the children. We can learn from Edie to accept death into our minds and hearts more openly and to build up our cultural identities, but we also learn we need to consider the feelings of our loved ones, invest in everyone's mental health, and understand that as a family, a household needs a compassionate and honest language about death, and that family legacy should be shared with some practical wisdom about accepting death and loss. Sam Sam Finch is one of the forgotten characters. 
His life kind of gets lost in the back of the family portrait we create in our minds when we play this game. I wouldn't blame you if you forgot about him entirely. In this game, it's easy to only see the character deaths, but it's very useful to look at the negative space in this painting and see the years these characters spent living. Although the story of Sam's death is told in a moving and ingenious way, like the others, the story of his life is easy to miss, but I would argue it's one of the most important. Sam Finch was Edie's fourth child. He and his twin brother Calvin were born three years after their sister Molly had died. Their sister Barbara was six years old and starring in movies when they were born. They grew up in the same room, decorated lovingly to match their interests. It's one of my favorite rooms in the game and showed that despite Edie's faults, she and her husband Sven loved their children very much. Sam's story really starts in 1960 when he and his brother are 10 and Barbara is murdered. Sam and Calvin weren't in the house when it happened the way their little brother Walter was, but this was the first of many losses for Sam. The year following, Calvin dies after falling from a dangerously placed swing set. And three years later, when Sam is 14, his father is killed constructing a dragon slide for Walter's birthday. From the time Calvin died when Sam was 10, Sam was forced to stay in the room he had shared with his brother as his brother's half was roped off and made into a shrine. As soon as Sam turned 18 and 68, he moved out of the room and joined the military, got married, and had his first child, Dawn, all in one year, probably in an effort to finally start his own story and get away from the past he had to live with daily. It was also when he was 18 that his brother Walter left home forever, and Sam never saw him again, never knowing that he was living in a bunker under the house. For several years, everything seemed to go well for Sam, as the last remaining finch of his generation above ground. He and his wife had two more children. And then in 77, the death started again. He lost his infant son Gregory, and five years later, his other son during Sam's second wedding. This was his last loss before Sam died himself a year later on a hunting trip with his daughter Dawn, the last survivor of her generation. In all, Sam lost five immediate family members. Although not much is said about how Sam dealt with the shock of loss, how he dealt with death in the long run can be seen from hints in the house. He was a survivalist with a military background. He ran an orderly household and wanted to teach his children how to survive. Most likely because the deaths in his life so far were the results of violent attacks, reckless behavior, and accidents. In complete contrast to Edie, Sam invested almost entirely in proximal defenses. He coped with the threat of mortality by focusing on prolonging life through discipline and preparation. And perhaps Sam's hunting habit was a way for him to confront death, as Edith alluded, which is another proximal defense. Sam didn't seem to engage in much distal defenses, like relationship building. He let Edie make a shrine of Gregory's crib, forcing Gus and Don to share a room with it the way he had as a young boy. His relationship with his son Gus seemed strained, especially by the fact that Sam didn't introduce his new wife to his children until the wedding day. And although it was clear they loved each other, Sam wasn't very aware of his daughter's feelings, or cared that much about what she wanted when it came to hunting. His top priority was teaching her the proximal defense of how to survive. He was trying to teach her his way of coping with mortality. Sam, to me, was one of the most realistic characters. His death, a hunting accident, is also hauntingly realistic. Through Sam, we might learn that although proximal defenses are helpful and important, and might have saved him many times before, ultimately they still cannot solve the riddle that is mortality. Instead, he might have benefited from strengthening his relationships with his children and offering guidance about how to grieve when you lose siblings the way he had. Walter was one of the longest surviving finches in this story, second to Edie. However, the majority of his life was spent underground, hiding from death. After witnessing or hearing the murder of his sister Barbara, and then after the death of his father who was building him a dragon slide for his 12th birthday, Walter went into hiding just as soon as his older brother Sam left home in 68, where he stayed till a moment of clarity in 2005 that inspired him to finally rise up from the bunker and break his 37 years of isolation only to die a few minutes into his newfound freedom. Walter's story is, of course, not as realistic as Sam's. He seems more like a character in a fable than an actual person. But the extreme lengths in which Walter tried to run from death is a perfect example of proximal defenses turned to obsession and rampant death anxiety. Walter, so traumatized and perhaps guilty after not trying to save his sister and feeling responsible for his father's death, shunned himself away also out of terror that he was next. His life prolonging activity was to do as little as possible and to risk as little as possible to make death a problem for another day. He shed any cultural affiliations, he didn't seem to care about his self-esteem, and his relationships waned to nothing as people forgot him. 
Edie, interestingly, and in my perspective cruelly, enabled his isolation. She fed him and supplied him with anything he wanted. She kept him and his new dwelling a secret from the family. She even perpetuated Mole Man rumors about Walter to the press, which I wonder if she might have started since Walter never once left the bunker to be seen by someone and even family didn't know about him. This was another example of Edie's failure to provide emotional support to her family. Instead of investing in Walter's mental health through counseling, which he would have desperately needed after Barbara's murder, she fed and enabled his fear. Perhaps she too believed that he was next in line for the curse and this was the only way to save him, and so she invested in creating this fantastical situation that would match the rest of her family's mythology. What I interpreted from Walter's story is the danger of running from death, an obsession with proximal defenses to the point that we no longer live our lives with joy or spontaneity. This is not to say that the recklessness that characterized many of the other finches was healthy, but perhaps what we need is a balance between a poised awareness of, of our vulnerabilities and a sober but adventurous interest in living life fully. Walter would have benefited from talking with Edie about her ability to calmly accept death. As someone who invested in distal defenses exclusively, she could have helped him. He might have learned from her to balance out his coping methods to relieve the death anxiety that was keeping him from engaging in a more well-rounded and fulfilled life. She may have also simply gotten him the help he needed. Another example of the importance for families and loved ones to share their thoughts on death and to work together to develop healthy coping mechanisms or to locate resources they need, like counseling to help them cope. Interestingly, Sam and his daughter Dawn both lost all their siblings, one parent, and all but one of their children. After her father died, Dawn graduated high school and immediately got away from Edie in the house, like Sam did, but by doing volunteer work abroad. There she met Sanjay, and immediately got married and had her first child, Louis. She started her new family, moved away from the house, and had two more children, Milton and Edith her new life starting just as quickly as her father's had. Everything went well for a while, until her husband died in a construction accident. After that, Dawn and her children returned to the Finch home where she homeschooled them. According to Edith, they had a few happy years like this. Edie was glad to have family back home and she was creative with giving them new rooms. The strangeness of the house didn't bother Edie and she got used to it quickly. But a few years later, Milton went missing, never to be seen again. In actuality, he really did go into one of his paintings thanks to a magic paintbrush. This detail was confirmed by the developers and is the one instance of supernatural activity in the game. It was mainly an easter egg to reference the developer's previous game, The Unfinished Swan. Largely, I like to think about the realism of this game instead of focusing on this one magical element and its implications. So let's move forward still with a lens of realism. After all the feelings of loss after a child goes missing, even if he really escaped into a fantastical realm, is the same for a mother whose child went missing somewhere in the real world. After Milton disappeared, Don sealed up all the shrines, terrified that they and the stories Edie connected to them were somehow responsible. And then, after some time, Don's son Lewis spiraled into daydreaming escapism until he believed his imagination was the true reality and took his own life. An interesting note is that Lewis is the only character confirmed to have actually received counseling services, helping us understand Dawn's involvement in her children's lives. It's directly after Lewis's death that Dawn confronts Edie about everyone leaving the house out of fear that the stories, and by extension the house, were killing her children. After arguing with Edie, Dawn grabs Edith and they leave everything behind. Edie passes away that night, probably due to mixing alcohol with her pills. Dawn and Edith move on for a while, but a few years later, Dawn falls ill, rarely discussing her sickness, and eventually passes away too. Dawn has been called the most normal finch, kind of like her father, and I think for this precise reason, she's very important. She's the one finch that seems to be scared of death in a very familiar way. She didn't hide from it like her uncle Walter, but after losing Milton, she sealed up all the reminders of her family's loss and grew scared of the stories about death, as if talking about death can summon it. This is how people in a death-negative culture behave. People don't go hiding in bunkers, but death becomes a bad word that needs to be censored. Dawn might have been the most normal finch, but it doesn't mean she was the most well-adjusted. Unlike her father, and more in line with Edie, she invested a lot of energy into distal defenses and very little into proximal defenses. Her only proximal defense seen was the opposite of both Edie and Sam. She didn't confront death. She seemed to run away from thinking or talking about it making it a problem for the future. 
Instead, she used culture, specifically her religious culture, as a means of comfort, although she didn't share this religiosity with her family. Upkeeping the general practice of independence for Finch family members to figure out their own fears, but also showing a similar emotional neglect that Edie and Sam portrayed towards her. Edith throughout the game makes comments about her mother hiding things from her, trying to protect her, but actually denying Edith some much needed honesty, comfort, and wisdom. This might sound familiar for us if we have a death negative household. Dawn didn't share her coping resources like religious or spiritual insight with Edith and refused to share important stories of loss like the loss of her father that Edith regretted not hearing about from her mother directly. Dawn even forbade the family stories that interested Edith like Edie's present in the final chapter. In the end, although we know that Dawn did her best, she still missed out on important opportunities to share her strengths and to help them anticipate loss in their lives because she was too afraid to consider conversations about death, mortality, sickness, or even spirituality as necessary or helpful. Edith is the playable character and the one Finch we can relate to the most given our time in her shoes. Through Edith, we discover all the stories, and we see through her eyes the history of each death as she tells us the context. The most important thing about Edith is the fact that she seems to have been a product of all of her family's history and the mixture of both her mother's and Edie's best influences. As she writes the journal for her unborn child the night she explores her family's empty home, she manages to have emerged from the experience with the wisdom new to the Finches. She learned from each of the stories a truth about death and dying that culminated in her closing words of the journal. Even though Edith was never able to tell her son these insights directly, she was able to break a different curse that plagued the Finches. She was able to refine the myth of the Finches from Edie's disturbing urban legends into a more or less accurate history that was actually emotionally and psychologically useful. She shared her feelings in her journal to her son, explaining the important parts and describing the confusion and pain surrounding her and her family's losses, and she still encouraged him to find peace with all of this knowledge. Although she was also scared of the stories like her mother was, she braved the fear and knew how to deliver them to her son in a comforting way. She succeeded where her mother failed in talking openly about death and sharing the stories with practical wisdom. She did what she could to develop a guiding relationship with her son, even if indirectly, and empathized with his feelings of being lost and afraid in a way Sam couldn't. She encouraged her son to enjoy life instead of living in fear, and although she passed the family legacy onto him like Edie would have, she pointed him towards the future and left the Finch house and its many shrines in the past where it belonged. Unlike any of the Finches before her, she left her son a deeply insightful and comforting guide for how to see death loss, and live calmly and even joyfully with the knowledge of a finite life. In many ways, I believe that if the Finches were troubled by a curse, it was one of blocked communication and unmet needs for sober, realistic comfort around the topics of death. And I think Edith broke that curse. In our own way, we can use this game as a tool to start breaking down our own curses, to process our fears and the many ways they appear in our lives and decisions. We might not have a matriarch in our family who cords off rooms of dead loved ones for half a century. We might know someone in our family that reminds us of Edie, or Sam, or Walter, or Dawn, or they might be us. If we play What Remains of Edith Finch mindfully, and always with an eye turned inward at our own families, our own attitudes about death, and our own relationships with our fear of these topics, we have a lot to gain. Although I have a rocky relationship with the idea of death after experiencing a loss years ago, by playing this game and spending time researching and writing this essay, I was able to soothe a significant amount of my death anxiety. It proved to be a helpful, though exhausting, session of exposure therapy that kicked me back into a few death positive positive habits that I had been avoiding in a Dawn or Walter-like way. I still have a long way to go till I truly feel calm again as I once had before my loss, but I credit this game with getting me a few steps closer and I'm grateful for it. In the end, we can come out of experiencing eudaimonic media like What Remains of Edith Finch not only being entertained, but given a chance to reorganize our thoughts, realign our priorities, and with a new intention to help ease not only our suffering, but the suffering of our loved ones through open, honest, and compassionate communication about death, dying, and mental health. We can also be reminded that while being prepared and knowledgeable about mortality is good, we can't forget to live mindfully and joyfully. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more about video games and mental health, please go ahead and subscribe.
And if you have any suggestions about other games you'd like to see covered, please go ahead and leave a comment below. Thank you. And as always, happy playing.